This episode of Digital Photography Cafe is brought to you by Focus Pyramid, the autofocus lens calibration tool for your DSLR camera. Welcome to the Digital Photography Cafe. I'm Trevor Current, your digital marketing guy. And I'm Joseph Christina, your professional photographer. So grab a latte, pull up a chair, and join us as we chat about the art and business of photography. Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. On last week's show, we talked about the talent agency scam, Lightroom 4, and the new iPad. If you haven't listened to last week's show, I encourage you to do so. You can find us on iTunes, or listen in your car on Stitcher Radio, or simply head over to our website, digitalphotographycafe.com, and listen online. Hey, Joe, so we are back again, episode 45. How you doing, man? Really good, really good, episode 45. I know, I know. Um, all right, hey, so you mentioned Stitcher there in the opening. Um, There's some pretty cool stuff going on, right? You just talked to uh, the CMO over at Stitcher, right? Yeah, the CMO. Um, we were in communication kind of back and forth email. Her name is, um, I believe it's Beth Murphy. And really, really nice. Um, I asked for some information regarding Stitcher. You know, thanked her, of course, for us being there because it's, I just think it's fabulous. And she went yeah, and it's really sent, cool. Very, very cool. Yeah. So she went and sent some information that I was looking through and reading through. I'm like, wow, this is really great. I mean, Obviously, if you don't know what Stitcher is, Stitcher is the leading internet radio aggregator. They take a ton of shows live and as we call them, Memorex on demand and they aggregate them together. Very, very cool. Um, and kind of in the copy that she sent over that we're kind of going back and forth with, they, she indicated there was 5 million downloads so far of Stitcher, which was, I mean, that's huge, right? Yeah, I know, it's a lot, 5 million. 5 million, and I think it was over 5,000 different shows. That's AM, FM, um, you know, obviously all the quality podcasts that um, that are out there, which are amazing. Um, and, uh, you know, further to that is they have things like NPR and um, CNN and the BBC and all of these, you know, incredibly big names that uh, are on there. So what's cool about it in comparison to satellite radio, um, you are able to get your local channels too. Now that for me is really big. You know, forever we weren't able to get local radio. You know, you'd listen to um, XM, let's say, and you'd have like that small number of a hundred channels and that's the end of it here. You're, you know, all of these 5,000 are aggregated in one place and now you can listen on the fly. Um, what they just did implement, which I thought was really cool, is something like, I would call it like a Pandora-esque, um, where they have this feature where you can kind of like thumbs up, thumbs down, or you can like or dislike things. And what it will do is it will go ahead and, you know, indicate to you other shows that you might like that are similar to what you're currently listening to, which is great. I mean, that is fantastic. Is you think about 5,000 shows, how do you figure out what you like or what you don't like? It'd be almost impossible to find, right? Yeah, yeah, I know, right? No, yeah. the recommendation's really cool too. And and I like too, now that they have uh, this Facebook timeline integration as well. Right. So this is, this is pretty neat. So now, you know, you can let your friends know on Facebook what you're listening to. So right. I, I really like it. I, I think it's a really neat idea. It's a really cool application. Um, and I like, I like that we're in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and I'm going to bring it up on the screen too. We were just in it. There was, um, we were like on the, on the front page for like a week or a week and a half. And we were just like right underneath the BBC and NPR or something. I'm going to bring it up so you can see it. But, uh, and that was just, it's just really cool. Um, what they are doing is they're doing this integration in automobiles. So, um, they yeah. just, they just talked about at South by Southwest, um, BMW, they had this whole big thing and, um, you know, BMW now has it integrated into their car itself. So you'd be able to, you know, plug in your iPhone or your iPad or whatever. And now right on the heads up there, right on the, the built in, um, BMW dashboard, you'd be able to go right to stretch stitcher and just pick out whatever you want to pick out. Thumbs up, thumbs up, the full integration in the car itself. And they're going to be doing that with Ford GM. And BMW, like I said, was just released like two or three days ago. That, that yeah, it's like right in their their what I guess they call their infotainment center. Um, yeah, I yeah. saw pictures of it, and it's like it's like this huge screen. I mean, you know, a lot of cars have built in nav, and it's kind of like a you know, kind of like a you know, a four three rectangular 
L, you know, LCD display or something like that. But this in the BMW looked much wider and it, it will actually display, you know, high resolution artwork in there for these different shows, um, as well as provide your navigation, your radio and, and all that other stuff too. So Amazing, yeah, right? it's really neat. I like it a lot. It's very, very cool. And, yeah. uh, you know, it's but, something that as it, as it expands into other manufacturers, um, I think that's really going to, uh, hopefully gain more exposure for us as well. <laughs> yeah, more traction for, you know, the the people that are doing this um, kind of as as we are, you know, yeah. the content creators that uh, don't have to go through the big name. We can actually do it ourselves and get it out there to the masses. So very, right. very cool. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So. All right. Um, everybody, we've you know, as you know, we were at WPPI 2012 and we had a bunch of of interviews that we did um, with all kinds of companies and they gave us all kinds of prizes to give away in, in our uh, in some giveaways that we're running. So uh, we've already given away some prizes and we've got a whole bunch more to give away. Um, but today we want to announce the winners for um, this really interesting product called the Daisy Grip. Um, the Daisy Grip, if you're not familiar with it, you can check it out at daisygrip.com. Um, it's really, really neat. It's kind of a, like an articulating arm, um, mm -hmm. almost, you know, similar to like what a gorilla pod would be almost, you know, how that articulates and can wrap around a pole. Um, it's like, it's an arm that clips into the hot shoe on your camera. And then it has little fingers that come off the sides of it and it will hold miscellaneous things. It'll, it'll hold a little puppet or a toy or something like that. And it really is ideal for people that are children photographers, children portrait photographers to, it really helps keep their focus into the camera as opposed to off camera above your head or, or wherever. So, um, they, they, we met with them and they gave an example. They brought the, the, uh, Daisy grip with them to, to, uh, our booth, you know, and they put the, the puppet on there right. and it was really neat. It just sat right down over the lens. So, yeah, you know, exactly. It, it's just perfect because instead of having that little squeak toy, like, you know, you see all the, <laughs> everyone using on one side or on the other side and you have the, or you have the parent on one side or the other side or over their head. It's just sure the, the, kid the is kids looking are looking everywhere. all over the place except yeah. the camera. You know? Exactly. And now it's actually, you have the puppet right on top of the lens. I mean, exactly over the yeah. lens. And then the legs actually wrap around the lens. And if you hold the camera right, I mean, the child barely even sees you behind the camera besides just the public puppet. And that's it. So yeah, very, very yeah. Cool. Which is really neat. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other uses that we actually talked about in the video as well. So definitely go check that out. We're, we'll put a link in the, the show notes so you can go see it. Um, so anyway, we're going to give away five of these Daisy Grips today, and each Daisy Grip has a retail value of seventy four dollars. So it's it's nice. Uh, it's a nice little prize. So um, the we selected five random winners from all those who that entered at our website, and we only have first names, of course, because that's all we asked for. So um, Chris, Dominique, Mike, Deja, and Steven. You guys are all going to be getting emails from us and, you know, we'll get your shipping info and everything and get these uh, really cool Daisy Grips out to you. Yeah, right out to you. Yeah, and we, we actually have a few more to give away of these too. So uh, we'll be announcing those winners over the, the coming weeks. Absolutely. Um, I guess we should kind of move into Pocket Wizard, right? We're going to be doing that Pocket Wizard 3 giveaway which uh like we stated in the past that we were the the first show the first organization first anyone to get a batch of these uh um a couple of these pocket wizard threes which are absolutely amazing and uh, that that was uh given to us by um david schmidt over at wppi when we interviewed with him um uh, what is it a couple of weeks back yeah, so. a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, we've got that video up on the site as well, and we'll put a link there. Um, Dave really gave us a great overview of the design and functionality of of these new Pocket Wizards. So you'll definitely want to check that that video out. Um, it's really cool. Uh, it's it's I don't know twenty minutes long or fifteen minutes yeah. long, something like that. But he yeah, really been, gives a great overview of it. I've been using Pocket Wizard since Pocket Wizard One, so I have a stack over here. I absolutely adore them. They are they're great. They are absolutely the the best um, trigger that I've used. Uh, right, I've used a bunch. So yeah, yeah, they're really cool. So how we're gonna give them away is we put we're we put together a blog post. So if you head over to digitalphotographycafe.com. 
um, you'll see a post that's right at the top that says, enter our Pocket Wizard plus three giveaway. And you can read the post. And there will be a, a widget in the post uh, that is the contest widget. And you can actually go in there. You can connect with your Facebook uh, account or you can just you know enter your name and email address, uh, what have you. And then really all you have to do is just follow the on-screen instructions. You know, you can um, enter just by answering a simple question. And the question is, what level photographer are you? And you can fill in the blank with beginner, advanced, professional. Um, that's all you have to do to enter. And then you're done. Now you can actually enter and do other things um, to increase your chances of winning. And you can read all about how to do that in the post. Um, it'll give you all the step-by-step -step instructions. So um, it'll be pretty easy to do. Yeah, absolutely. They have to jump over. I'm tell you what, I, I want. I think I'm going to go enter. The win. <laughs> we can't enter. <laughs> I, know. I, I see these things sitting over here. I'm like, man. You know, yeah, wanna... they'd be cool to win, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, you're looking at about $300 worth of, you know, transceivers. I mean, yeah. Like, yeah. I think it's about 300 that. bucks. Yeah. And yeah. It's a pair of them. So you've got one for your camera and one for a flash. Yeah. And now, you know, once you get the pair, if you have multiple flashes, you can always just buy the individual units to connect to those flashes. So yeah, really easy to enter. Just head on over to the site, click in the uh, that post and you can enter right in the box there. Now to throw a little bit of legal stuff at you because you know we kind of have to mm -hmm. do that. Uh, oh, the, yeah. gi the giveaway starts on Monday, March 19th, 2012 at 12.01 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. And it ends on Sunday, March 25th, 2012 at 12.01 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. The giveaway is open to U.S. residents only who are 18 years of age as of March 19th, 2012. And we'll notify, who, you know, the winner um, by by email. So uh, just, you know, don't worry about that. We'll, we'll get in touch with you and definitely read the terms and conditions before entering. Yeah, so you guys have a week to win, so go enter. And definitely there's some other options so you can get more chances to win. So definitely um, be on the lookout on that page on how to do that. I encourage you to do that. You can get more chances is definitely better. Yep. Yep. The greater <laughs> so, um, your chances. Yeah. Yeah. So I was uh, kind of scouring the web as I do. And um, this this article that just came up uh, from I think it was TechCrunch. And they had the, the title was Apple will buy back your old iPad 2. I'm like, wow, that sounds interesting, hmm. right? Yeah, 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 yep. Get them out there. So um, really, really interesting. You, They'll actually take your iPad 2 back and they'll give you approximately 40% um, back for it off their original retail price. So that's really not bad considering you had, what, about a year or so of use? Sure, yeah. I mean, the iPad 2 came out like a year ago. Um, if you just recently purchased one before the iPad or before the new iPad came out, um, well, I guess, <laughs> the you know, new, new iPad, right? the new, the, new the iPad, new you know, I guess uh, maybe it would burn you a little bit. But if you were the one of the first people to buy the iPad, too, and you've had it for about a year. Um, yeah, I mean, it's part of the Apple's recycling program and they will actually, <clears throat> excuse me, buy back your computers and stuff as well. Um, but with this, with this iPad buyback, I mean, it, like 40% of what you paid for it is pretty cool. So for example, if you have an iPad, uh, if yeah, you have the, an iPad two, um, Wi-Fi with the three G and a 64 gigabyte capacity, they'll actually give you $320 back for that's it. That's amazing. Yeah. That's not bad. That's not bad at all. No, it's really not bad. So, uh, so yeah, definitely check that out. We'll put a link in the show notes so you can um, head over to Apple's site and read about it. You know, they'll they'll buy back the, you know, the the other Wi-Fi only and 3G models as well. You know, obviously the prices are less because you paid less. But right, uh, right. yeah, it's it's pr a pretty good deal if you're looking to upgrade and if you've got to have the latest, you know, tech that comes out. It's latest a good option for you. Yep. Absolutely. I know mine, uh, mine the, would be the smaller one, so I'll get a couple hundred bucks back. But you know what? Um, something's better than nothing and uh, they'll they'll probably end up refurbing it and sending it to um, another country or, or yeah. do something great with it maybe send it into school system or whatever um, apple is usually very green when it comes to this stuff so that's great 
Yeah, yeah, that's really cool. So uh, something else that happened this week, um, we had a, a great comment over on the blog about, um, in reference to the 5D Mark III episode from uh, two weeks ago. And, uh, you know, we, we talked back and forth about it. And I know, Joe, you had made some comments and expressed your opinions about the the canon and, you know, its pros and cons and stuff. And, right. uh, you know, so the question of megapixels came up. And, you know, how we said during the conversation that, you know, the megapixel war is over, um, you know, but on the other hand, you were saying that, you know, you really would prefer to have had the 36 megapixels that the Nikon wanted. So, right. you know, you know, I guess he was kind of like, well, you know, there's kind of a conflict of opinion there. So, you know, maybe you can just kind of explain that a little bit more what you were what you were trying to say. Right, right, right. Yeah. So, I mean, as far as the megapixel goes, um, you know, it, it's one of those things where I'll give you a perfect example. You know, we've done billboards with 20 D's in the past that are 60 by 30 in size, you know, absolutely. Right. And that's 60 by 30 feet, not inches. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. huge. And those are eight megapixel cameras. So, um, you know, what really is important, obviously, is, you know, where is the image going to be shown? What's the medium and what is the distance of the viewer? Right. right, right. Um, the the thing that came up, which you said, um, which was which which I agree a hundred percent with it, um, is you said uh, something about you know twenty two megapixels that we're getting with the Canons are those the same quality megapixels as the Nikon is giving um, with the D eight hundred at thirty six, and that is really a good question because sure. at that point if they are the same quality pixels, I want more. Period. Yeah. End of story. You know, just like a Hasselblad 40 um, a megapixel or a 50 or a 60 on a medium um, format camera, you're going to get beautiful pixels and you're getting a ton of them. So more at that point is not just more. More is actually better. Better. Yeah. Now, a side note to that really quick is that, um, you know, too many people, they they instead of framing a shot and then shooting, and this is kind of what I alluded to last uh, a couple of weeks ago. They will go ahead and shoot an image and then they'll frame it after the fact. Well, in so doing, let's say you're cropping in or you're like I told, like I said a couple of weeks ago, the art director needs to crop in 50 percent. Well, in essence, if you start out with a 22 megapixel camera at that point, you're down to 11 megapixels that is left. So you're, you're basically you've turned your three, four thousand dollar high end DSLR into a point and shoot. So, as far as the, resolution goes, as sure. far as resolution yeah. goes, right? Yep. And this happens all the time. You know, I don't know if people realize it or they understand that, but that's really the gist of it. So that's kind of where where I was going with that, as far as the megapixel goes. You know, if the if the pixels are the same, I want more. Period. End of story. Right. Yeah. Now his other comment, which which was good too, is that you know you're asking for more megapixels on the sensor for still images, but then you're kind of saying on the video side that. You know, nobody really needs 1080p and that 720 was was uh, really good enough. And, you know, I mean, that's not exactly what we talked about, but, you know, maybe you want to just address that a little bit yeah. more too. So, you know, I really didn't want to get into a debate between, you know, 720 over 1080. You know, of course, if you can shoot 1080, your computer can handle it. Um, go ahead and do so and then go ahead and, you know, dumb it down after the fact. It's great. But sure. for most, you know, most people, um, where, you know, where are movies going to be shown that you create? They're not going to be on the silver screen, you know, and even on a silver no. screen, you're not going to shoot with a 5D Mark II anyways. You need a red, you know, you need 4K, you need, you need right. 4,000, right. you don't, you don't need a thousand. So anyways, um, but in regards to what I was saying about the, um, the 5D Mark III only offering 50 and 60 frame, um, um, uh, frames per, per second on the, on that, that, that body. 50 to 60 is great at 720, but if we have the latitude to move into a 23, 24, 25, 30, it would be much better because we can marry multiple cameras together much, much more easily. Um, and I'll give you a perfect example of this. We were an early adopter. Our studio picked up the 5D Mark IIs like basically immediately. Um, as we said weeks ago, we went from the 5Ds to the 5D Mark IIs, the 7Ds, we have a bunch. Um, but the 5D Mark IIs, when we got them, they originally only shot 1080p at 30 frames. Well, you know, that's great, but that's really not what we wanted, right? right. We wanted 24, right. we yep. wanted 25, you know, we wanted, you know, um, 
29.97. We wanted these other frame rates, right? So what happened? We all complained about it. We stood up and said, listen, no, you know, 30 frames is just not gonna do it. We need more. So in less than a year, what happened? Out came, I think it was 2010, a firmware update. That firmware update allowed us or gave us all those other frame rates, the 24, the 25, the 29.97 that we've been asking for, begging for, and there you have it. So when I pose this question about the 720, I'm merely putting it out there as a a good way for a conversation to be started. And hopefully there's other people that possibly might need those frame rates and start requesting it, complaining about it. And it gets to Canon and Canon says, you know what, let's go ahead and do a firmware update because a firmware update doesn't take any time at all. And now all of a sudden we have um, greater latitude. Greater greater capability. Sure. I mean, on the user's end to do a firmware update is not that big of a deal. It's nothing. And now your camera has greater functionality. And now, I mean, I agree. I mean, working, working in 1080p, unless you need 1080p, unless you need that resolution because you're burning, you know, your movies out to Blu-ray or something like that. Um, it's, it's cumbersome to work with. It's, it's big files. It's pretty heavy. You've got to, you've got to have, you know, be running, supercomputers that work efficiently with them, especially if you start working with multiple video layers and audio layers and transitions and lower thirds and all that stuff. I mean, realistically, 720p for most usage really is good enough. I mean, anything you're gonna put up on the web, um, especially up to YouTube, that is more than five minutes long, you really need to do it 720. Because if you try and upload a 1080p, um, video. I mean, yeah, you can do it. And if it's only a minute or two long, you know, go for it. But if you're trying to put something that's a longer length, those file sizes are just too large. You just can't upload them. You know, they're gigs. I mean, it'll take you a day or two to upload a a single file to, to YouTube. And then you have to worry about the people on the, the downstream being able to process and decompress and recompress and, you know, all that stuff, the video. So, I mean, I think that's really, I mean, me personally, I don't want to work in 1080p. I mean, I'm I'm working in 720. I honest. mean, this show, if anyone's actually watching the show and not listening, um, what you see is approximately five or six audio layers and probably about 20 layers of video going on. Yeah. So um, you can imagine if you with you know 20 layers of um, different video tracks and and images and transitions and all that stuff. This stuff gets very big very quick. Um, and like I was saying, you know, the 1080 for the most part, for most people out there will end up being overkill. And so having that latitude at 720 and being able to bring them in at those different frame rates, um, will give people an easier ability to do better editing, um, with a, I guess, a less powerful machine. Right. Exactly. That's exactly right. So, you know, we talk about video, we talk about the megapixels in the, for the still images. Um, we didn't, we didn't. Talk about focus. Focus is so important, right? <laughs> so, so while we're talking about focus, let's take a moment to thank this week's sponsor, Focus Pyramid, the auto focus lens calibration tool for your DSLR camera. So if you wanna make the absolute sharpest images possible, you need to take control over your DSLR's focusing system. Focus Pyramid makes lens calibration quick, easy, and cost-effective at an amazing price. So head over to focuspyramid.com and pick up yours today. And you can actually go to focuspyramid.com forward slash DPC and you'll get 10% off just for being a show listener. Excellent. Excellent. As they say, get it right in the camera. Get it right. The same thing we were talking about earlier um, with uh, shoot, right? And frame first, then shoot. Don't shoot and then frame later. Get it right in the camera. Get it right in the camera. Don't try and don't try and sharpen your image after the fact because it really just doesn't doesn't yeah. work as good. You know, no. get it nice and sharp up front and it's going to save yourselves a lot of headaches, that's for sure. <laughs> a lot of time and time is money. So, yeah. um I guess we should kind of move into another I think you had another question, right? Came through Twitter. Yeah, this yeah, this is really great. Um one of our one of my Twitter followers, um uh Danielle Melton um at Danny 829 um, she actually sent a message over to me just really it was kind of informal just asking my opinion about a a photography school that she was looking at in Philadelphia and the conversation kind of went on and and you know kind of 
went into the opinion about the school, which, you know, I thought the, the school was, was really going to be fantastic. And then, you know, the whole topic of education kind of came up in, and is formal education in photography and the visual arts really needed? You know, can we, can we really just kind of learn on our own or mm -hmm. do we need that formal training? So mm -hmm. that's kind of where the, the conversation um, led. And, you know, this really is a big topic. So I'm just going to, we're just going to kind of touch on it a little bit, but, yeah. you know, yeah. I, I think, you know, uh, for me, I look at it as, um, you know, formal verse, trying to do it ad hoc yourself um, through DVDs and through just learning just by shooting. Um, I, I look at it doing the, the educational process itself, going to school is like, you know, I would say it's equivalent to taking like a white crayon, right? You are the white crayon. You really have no knowledge and you can draw and it just nothing really happens with it. But <laughs> as you start, you know, as you start learning that crayon becomes, you know, different colors, turns blue and then turns red and you actually can do and create things. I think that creativity comes out not of the white crayon, but of the color crayon, right? You need to have the basis. Um, so I, I am, I guess, uh, I would say education would definitely come first and formal education of some type, if the funds are available and you're, and there's time available for me, I think that is the best way to go to give you a good basis, gives you the tools yeah. to create, right? Yeah, I agree. I mean, if you, if, especially if you're, I mean, I say if you're young and just getting out of high school and you don't really know what you want to, you know, you, you know that you want to be in the arts, you know, you want to be in a photography, um, then I would say, you know, take the time, go to school. You really haven't started working a full-time job yet, you know, go to school full-time and get the training if you can afford it. Obviously there's an expense there. Not everybody can afford to go full-time. Right. Um, even if, you know, even if you're a little bit older, maybe you've been out working for a while, maybe you're looking for a career change. You know, if the funds allow it, if your lifestyle allows it and you can go back and and go either full time or maybe do the continuing education route, maybe do a night night class and stuff, a um, few night classes a week. I totally recommend it. I mean, I went to school for, you know, I'm formally trained in, you know, design and photography and I would not change that for a minute. I mean, I right. have no regrets about that. I had some amazing teachers that were able to show me things and help develop that creativity that I already had, you know, where, I mean, you know, we've talked about this before in other shows. I don't think you can teach creativity. Right. You can nurture creativity. You can, you can inspire creativity. You can teach the tools needed to, to develop and grow that creativity. But if you're not a creative person, going to art school for you is is going to be difficult. You know, right. I, I mean, I don't I, I'm not going to say that you couldn't come out and be a star, um, but I, I just don't know that you're going to ever have that creative flair that that really goes into it. So, I mean, that and that's something that you really have to take a long, hard look at You know, yourself. Do you see yourself as a creative person and will you right. really benefit? from the education are are you more of a technical person and if you're more of a technical person and not as much as a, of a creative maybe it's not necessary maybe you can learn what you need to learn um on your own right no ab absolutely um you know just like what i was kind of saying you know creating i i kind of look at it like music or voice you know you either you have it or you don't you can yeah. learn how to play a piano um you can learn how to play the notes and play them in time and it will sound absolutely beautiful but it's a copy you are proficient at copying whatever that is that someone else created but once you learn your tools right and you do have that in you that creative spark you right. can then create a new song from scratch a new composition a new photograph a new way of photographing a new way of designing fashion or whatever whatever the case might be that i do believe in what you're saying you you that's not really learned i think to copy is is learned but to create sure. is something that is within you and you know it's uh, but but you need your tools regardless for me you still need to go to school. You need to have your tools, but I don't think all the tools in the world are gonna have, you know, help someone that doesn't have that creative spark 
be able to be great. Yeah. They'd be proficient and they'd be able to do what they need to do to get by, but to become from that just mediocre into that stellar level, um, that's something I think that is, uh, I think something that comes at birth. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, you know, as far as education goes, depending on where you are in your photography, you know, hobby or career, you know, you could just maybe take some workshops, some specialized workshops where you can learn whatever it is, that task, you know, lighting or or composition or whatever. Um, you know, you could take that. They're, they're shorter classes, they're more intense, and you'll really learn whatever it is that you're looking for. I mean, the other way is, you know, the school of hard knocks, right? Real world experience. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so many people go out and they start these photography businesses. Some fail, some succeed. Um, you know, regardless, if your end goal is to be in photography or, or the visual arts as a profession, you need to have a business sense. Now, I mean, do you have to go to school for business? No, uh, you know, especially if you've already got a knack for business, you can learn marketing, you can go to county cl college and take some night classes on, on marketing, on business and such. But, you know, so many businesses, so many photography businesses fail because they are not good at the business side. Right. And we've said this over and over a million times too. I mean, you know, most of your photography business is the business side. It's not the shooting side. Right. And so you really, you do need to have that education. You know, you need to have something there to succeed. So, you know, this might be something that we can um, explore a little bit further later yeah. on, you know, really talk more about education, maybe look at some different schools and, you know, the types of classes they offer, you know, a four year yeah. degree, getting your bachelor's of fine art as opposed to a technical school, a uh, trade school, you know, those types of things. Cause there's a lot of different options out there for you. It's a huge, huge yeah. topic for sure, for yeah. sure. But, you know, so uh, anyway, I think it's that time again, right, Joe? I think it's time. It I definitely is. We've okay. we've kind of extended it um, a little bit. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Definitely, it's time to get out. Yeah. So uh, let's thank everybody as usual for uh, joining us. And if you have any topics or uh, comments, you know, you can definitely send them over to us uh, through the website at digitalphotographycafe.com, or you know, just connect with us at Twitter at dphotocafe. And if you enjoy the show, as always, please subscribe in iTunes or via RSS and you'll get them sent to your computer automatically. So Joe, if people want to learn more about you and what you're up to, how can they connect with you? So I Trev, they can find us on the website. That's AllureMM.com. Twitter, that's at Joseph Christina. And that's Christina without an H. On Facebook, that's Facebook.com forward slash AllureMM. And on Google Plus, that's G plus JC. Dot com. Great. And you can keep up with me on Twitter at Trevor Curran and on Google Plus by going to gplustc.com. And of course, check out our website at currentphotographer.com and facebook.com forward slash current photographer. All right, Trev, listen, great show as always. I'd like to thank the listeners for their continued support. If you enjoy the show, why not buy your caffeine addicted host a cup of coffee? We've added a tip jar to the website, so please consider making a donation. If you're listening on the go, fear not. Everything that we've covered during this week's show can easily be found in your show notes at our website, digitalphotographycafe.com. Once again, keep your questions and comments coming, and we'll talk to you next week.